19. So yesterday you guys did the um, phantoms and the panic model. You did phantoms and panic when you were given data that you could put into your calculator and then you could compute the linear regression T test and T interval in your calculator. But now we're going to talk about how do you do this if maybe your calculator will not compute T interval for you and um, or if you have computer information. If you have a computer printout, then you have to do the test. You have to get the test information by hand and the interval information by hand. And so some of that's just knowing where to find the data. So that's what we're going to go over now. <clears throat> First of all, let's take a look at our computer printout. We see here that we've got 55 degrees of freedom. Um, <clears throat> so that's nice that it shows us there that we had 57 pieces of data, subtract 2, and there's your 55 degrees of freedom. By the way, I've seen some problems, and I've actually seen this twice on the AP exam, where they do not tell you how many pieces of data there are, or they don't tell you degrees of freedom, or how many pieces of data there are. You had to actually go and count. Of course, they didn't do it with this many pieces. But you had to go to the data and count the number of pieces of data so that you could um, get that degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, I also wanted to show you one other way that this degrees of freedom shows up in a different format. You could see a computer printout like this. Um, let's see here. You could see a computer printout like this. And what I'm interested in is showing you this little section right here. This says DF, and it's got a number 1, and it's got a number 18. Some have then they total that, and they write 19 here. So I want to tell you, of all of this, 1, 18, and 19, which one is your DF, and do you need to subtract by 2 or not? This one right here is the degrees of freedom, it's the residual, I've seen this also word the error, because see you can see up here that coincides with what they told you here, 20 minus 2 is 18 degrees of freedom. So there's the 1, there's the 18, and then the total, 18 was it. Here is another one. I found this, this was in a, um, a computer, or I'm sorry, a college class, because it was for ANOVA model, it was explaining ANOVA, which we don't do yet, but look at, I want you to look at this right here. It's hard to see, and I'm sorry about that. But it says regression. It says DF. So you're thinking, okay, that's where the degrees of freedom are. This top row says regression is 1. Residual error, 14. Total is 15. Well, it states here, and I'm not exactly sure why it totals it for us, but the degrees of freedom is this number here that's the residual error that is for confidence intervals and significant tests and that is the n minus 2. Okay, so there's your degrees of freedom if you need to find it. Alright, now um, back to this. We are interested in the slope line. Okay, so in this case this is a problem about education and your income. So we are interested in the line about slope. So, of course, let's talk about the letters that represent these. This first number is the sample slope. So that is the letter B. And that, of course, is your sample slope. Okay. This next number, 471.2, do you know what that is? It's under SE coefficient. What does that mean? Standard error of the coefficient, which is the same thing as standard deviation of the coefficient. So that is the standard deviation of the slope. Okay? All right. This next thing is under the column titled T ratio. That is your T score. So if you were to run a linear regression T test, this value right here is the t-score that you could list. You didn't even have to write it. You didn't even have to do any computing in the calculator. The computer printout says 5.19 is the t-score. And finally, of course, under p-value, 
here is the p value that you would list if you were to do a phantoms model you would list your t score and your p value and your degrees of freedom and so there is where the p value is found okay so for phantoms all it is is you know locating that information on the computer printout all right but for a panic model, and in this case, let's read this problem because we're going to do this together. The following data gives information from the United States Census Bureau on max education obtained and current yearly income. Create a 90% confidence interval for the slope of the relationship between education and income for United States employees. And so let's actually do a panic model right now without the assumptions yet. So let's do that. I'm going to erase a some of this information. In fact, I'm going to probably erase it all because I won't have enough room later. Okay, so we're going to make an interval. What's the first thing that we need to do in a panic model? Parameter. What is the parameter that we use for this? Beta. And what is beta? Perfect. Slope of the relationship. Yep, it is straight written there slope of the relationship between education and income. Okay, we are going to save assumptions for the last 20 minutes of class. I'm going to teach you the assumptions today. You won't have homework on it, but then you will have the whole entire class period tomorrow to do and practice assumptions because they're pretty intricate. All right, so there's, per, uh, for the panic model, there is your, um, let me get this back, there is uh, parameter, skipping assumptions, name of this that we're about to do, what is it? Linear regression, T interval. We are going to be making a 90% confidence interval for the value of the slope. Okay. All right. Now we're going to compute the interval. And we don't have data to put into our little calculator to go and let it just give us a t linear regression t interval and plop out the answer. We have to do it more by hand. So in order to do it by hand, you have to know the formula. So I'm going to refresh your memory on where what that is and where it is found because at this point in the year I'm telling you you know I'm leaving it with you as to where to find these things and then it you you've got to then be able to use your brain and find the resources on your own so here's the formula chart here's the front of it it's not on the front it is on the back here's the back of the formula chart confidence interval is located right here on the formula chart Okay, so let's look at that closer. All right, so our confidence interval is the statistic, which is the sample of the what we're trying to estimate. So what is the sample, that, or what is the um, item we're trying to estimate with our intervals? What are we estimating with this interval? The value of beta, which is, what is beta? The population slope. So this is the sample slope. So that will be your little b. That is your sample slope. We're going to use a sample slope to estimate the population slope. Plus or minus critical value. What's that? T star. This is not a T score. In other words, this right here this 5.19 is not your T star. That number says the sample you got is 5.19 um, standard deviations out. A critical value. What is a critical value based off? What is T star? How do you know what T star to use? What gives you that information? It depends based on how what they want you to be. the confidence level. Okay, so this T star, T star is based on how confident they want you to be. 
so the confidence level. And we find it by going inverse T of one tail, comma, degrees of freedom. Inverse T of one tail, comma, degrees of freedom. Okay, and standard deviation of the slope, that is the S of B. All right, so let's go do this formula here. So the formula is B plus or minus T star times standard deviation of the slope. And let's go ahead and fill those numbers in now. Okay, what is this value of B here? Yes, it's that value up there, 2444.79. Okay, plus or minus T star. It is not 5.19. Nope. I get that number. Inverse T of one tail. What do I mean one tail? I mean this. Let's see here. I want to be 90% confident. 90% confident puts 90% in the middle, which puts 5% in one of the tails. So this lower T star is going to be located at that position. So I'm going to do inverse T of, what's one tail? 0 0.05 comma 55 degrees of freedom. That number is 1.67. If I calculated it on my calculator, inverse T of one tail, comma, degrees of freedom. And then S of B, standard deviation of the slope, is this little number right here, 471.2. So I'll go ahead and compute all that for you, save you some time, and let's write the interval. So here it is beta colon, because that's what we're estimating is beta. I think next year I'm going to always make them put something in front of the interval. I like that. Beta colon. It comes out to be 1656 comma 3233. They're pretty large numbers, so I went ahead and just did them to the whole number. Degrees of freedom must include the DF, 55. Okay, so there's that. So, we've done the parameter, we're skipping assumptions, we've named it, we've done the interval. C is left, that is the what? Conclusion. And so how do we start our conclusion? I am 90% confident, yeah, since is when it's a test. But for our confidence interval, it's I am 90% confident that, and I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to do something a little different. You could write it out like you did yesterday, which was this. I'm 90% confident that the true slope of the relationship between education and income is between 1656 and 3233. But I think it'll make more sense, and we're all about making sense in here. Okay, We're all about context and what does this mean. So I think it'll make more sense in real world terms if we interpret the slope at the same time. So talk to me about interpret the slope. Interpret the slope, well, how does that go? We're gonna say for every one increase in the X. And what's our X in this problem? Education. So I am 90% confident that for every one increase, oh, actually it's for every year, increase in education for every one increase in the X, the, the predicted income increases or goes up um, 1656 to 32, 33. In my mind, 
in real world terms, that makes more sense. To say, for every one year increase in your education, your income will increase 16 to 56, or 15, whatever, 16, 30, 56 to 32, 33 on average. Okay? Um, we could, but I've not seen that as a requirement on AP exam, so I'm not putting it with it right now. Just trying to keep that simple. Okay, so I have taught you in these first few minutes how to read a computer printout and how to do a phantoms model and a panic model from that. And so we're go I'm going to stop right now and let you do pages 16 and 17 in your packet for your assignment. And then the last 20 minutes of class, I'm going to come back and teach you assumptions. Let's go to page 16 because I do want to point out one thing on that. So over here to page 16. So here's a computer printout. I'm not going to go over that. But let's look at this first question. A says, is a simple linear model useful for predicting ozone level? This is about ozone level in parts per million and the population of the city. So is it useful for predicting ozone level and the population of the city? Support your conclusion with appropriate statistical evidence. Correlation coefficient and residual plot. You do not have the individual data, so you have no plots and you have no graphs given to you. So this is a no-go. If they gave you the picture of the residual plot, you could do that. You could reference that. So all you're having to do here on A is reference the correlation coefficient represented by the R, okay, and then define it and so on. And that's going to be your way to answer part A. And so then, of course, you know down here on part D where it says, is there a significant linear relationship? This is your phantoms without the assumptions yet. And there is room on the top of the next page to do this phantoms model. And then finally, here is your panic that you're going to do. Um, down here is the panic, okay, without the A. And I guess your perimeters or your P's on the previous page. Okay, so work on 16 and 17, and I will meet back with you guys in uh, the last 20 minutes of clap. Okay, so we're going to um, continue this problem on page 19 where we will do the conditions, and we will learn the conditions. The notes for conditions is back on page 12, so we're going to talk about those real quick and then jump over here to page 19 and do those. So if I go over here to page 12, okay, the bottom of page 12 is where these conditions are listed if you are wanting to look at that. So the bottom of page 12 is where I'm at. These are the conditions. These are actually, there's this big word called homoscedacity. And so there we do all of these things to check for homoscedacity. And so I kind of did a lot of research on this to try and um, kind of make this simpler so that we understand and have a set way to determine homoscedacity, and we're going to use the mnemonic device L-I-N-E. So the first thing that we will do is check for linearity. Linearity, we will write down the correlation coefficient and then define it. You know, there's a moderate, strong, positive, whatever, linear relationship. And then we will check it. We will reference a graph of just the basic graph of XY and say, see, look at the graph of XY. It looks pretty linear. We're good. So that's basic linearity. I put independence and random together, so that's really two conditions in one. I kind of did that so it's line and not liner. So for the liner, we're going to say that we randomly select. Remember, we randomly select the subjects from their population. And for independence, um, I guess that I researched this and found that you don't have to do the 10% thing. So I guess that wasn't involved. What was most important for independence was that you say, you know, one of the pieces of data is not affecting the other piece of data. So they are independent of each other. All right? So that's how we will do that. This normal probability plot is new to you. 
normal probability plot, what we are looking for is this. We are looking to see that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. The residuals are fairly normally distributed. And so I want to show you a picture that we were going to draw on page 9. We didn't. I think I'm probably I think it's going to be simplest if I just include it in the packet from now on, completely done. I want to talk about the residuals being fairly normally distributed with this picture here. So we know that our data around the, our plots, our residuals around the um, least squares regression line, the prediction line, is going to have 68% of the data within one standard deviation. Right? We've discussed this before. So 68% should be within one standard deviation. And then they're going to get more sparse as you go out. So we're getting 95% within two standard deviations. So essentially, these normal curves are being formed, and that's giving that normal distribution of the residuals. Okay? The residuals are being fairly normally distributed around this prediction line. Here is another view of it. If you think of it in a three-dimensional line, I know that sounds strange because a line is two-dimensional, but if you think of the line being the center of your normal curve, the prediction line is the expected value and is the mean. Then you've got you know, your normal models. If you could think of this three-dimensionally coming out, then you've got your 68% one standard deviation away and 95% is two standard deviations away, and so on. So that's what we're interested in seeing, if the residuals are fairly normally distributed. And finally, we will check for equal variance in the residual plot. We are checking to see that they are distributed equally, you know, evenly, distributed equally and scattered, um, equally varied on either side of the... the um, least squares regression line. For example, here would be one that represents good and, you know, equal variance in the residual plot. Your data you know, is pretty equally varied on either side of that residual plot. That's good. Equal varied on either side of the, of the linear regression, least squares regression line. Here is a bad one. This would be something where you have your prediction line here, and maybe your data seems to be a good fit in this area, but the farther you get out, the farther your data is varied about this line. So this is not considered equally varied. As the prediction line continues on, you get much worse fit. So this is not equally varied in the residual plot. Okay, so that's what we are trying to guard against. All right, so let's now, okay, and then we'll, uh, sorry, we'll conclude linear regression T model applies. Let's go over to page 19 and do that with the problem, the data that we have. So I'm going to tell you that I will not ever have you create the graphs and then have to reference them. I at one point did, but I have noticed on AP exam, anytime they expect you to do the conditions for this, they will provide the graphs for you to be able to reference. So let's, see, let's um, analyze the graphs that they give us here. So here's this top graph. What does the x-axis say? It looks like it says predicted income. So it appears to me that they're actually um, putting the y-axis down here, which is okay. What's on the side? The residuals of the income. So this is the residual plot. It's a little deceptive because you do not see this prediction line in there. How would it, what should I do? Where is the prediction line on this? It's in the middle. Do you, does, is this a zero right here? Yeah, that is a zero residual. That is where your prediction line is. So they just don't have it drawn in there. So I'm going to be using this graph to reference 
equally varied on either side of the residual plot, or at uh, least squares regression line. Okay? Let's label this graph A, just so later it's easy for us to reference it. Let's label this one graph B, and let's look at what this is a picture of. What's the x-axis on this one? Education. The y-axis on this one is income. So this is a graph of what? It's your basic x, y graph. It's your basic x, y. Does it look linear? We're going to reference this on telling if it looks like a linear model, Does and our prediction line should be going right through the middle of it. And let's do this last one, call it graph C. This is a new kind of graph for you, so let me explain it. Can you see what's written on the x-axis? It says normal scores, otherwise known as your z-scores. So that means if you have zero, then your observed was the same thing as expected. You have a z-score of zero. It equaled the mean. You know, and so we're interested in one standard deviation out, two standard deviations out, and so on. So these z-scores, because we're interested in one standard deviation away from the mean, two standard deviations out, and we're wondering how those residuals play a part in that. So this should be residuals of income is what I think that is. Do you see zero is also in the middle here? Well, if I map these two together, that means that that is the values, right there are the values that have a z-score of zero because the observed is what was expected. The data was on the prediction line. So these pieces of data were on the prediction line. And the farther I get away, the farther the residuals were from predicted. Okay, these farther away from predicted. All right, so here's what you are looking for on this graph. What you are looking for is that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. And you can see that by looking at this one standard deviation out should be more densely populated than the two standard deviations out and so on. Because this one standard deviation from the mean should be containing 68% of your data points. And so it's more densely populated. And then this two standard deviations out is a little, those are more spread out. Do you see how those are more sparse on the outside edges? Those are the 95% of the data points and so on. So the purpose of this graph, I'll go ahead and write it here, but we'll write it again when we do our conditions. What we are looking for here is that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. That's what this, the purpose of this graph is, telling us that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. Now, there's another, you could do a histogram and also demonstrate that. I will show you an example of that. This uh, picture here, look here. Here's how this graph could also be demonstrated. Here's my residuals, here's zero. Do you see how they are fairly normally distributed around the prediction line? So this is another one that's demonstrating that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. All right, so with all of that information, let's now go back to this and do our conditions. So here we go. What's the first one? Linearity. Okay, linearity. And what do I do for linearity? Okay, what, what am I referencing for linearity? R, good. Okay, so R, if we did, if you uh, did the square root of whatever that was, it comes out to be 0.57. So what would we write about that? There is a moderate positive linear relationship 
between education and income. What graph demonstrates that for me? Graph B represents, yep, so C graph B. So I'm going to put graph B shows linear pattern. Okay? All right, that's the linearity. Yes. If it's like zero, if the R value is 0 0.1.2, I'm going, I'm kind of freaking out about that, thinking that's pretty messed up. Yes? Um, because you could have something, you know, that's just real loosey-goosey around it like that, and maybe that gives you a moderate R value, but it's definitely, you know, it's got a pattern in it. And so you cannot just tell from R. Can you tell from R? No. Okay, right. So that's going on there. Okay, next. What's the next condition after linearity? Independent and I tacked on uh, random. I threw that in there. So independent and random. Write that down and then we'll put what to write. Independent slash random. So I'm going to say that these are randomly selected employees assumed randomly selected employees assumed because it did not say I'm also having to assume and I think it's reasonable that one employees education slash income does not affect other employees education slash income. So there's our independent random question. All right, now to the two new things. N stands for what? Normal probability plot. This is where we show that the um, residuals are fairly normally distributed. And what shows us that? Okay, graph C shows us, shows that the residuals are fairly normally distributed. Equal variance in the residual plot equally varied on either side of the LSRL. That's what you're looking for. What graph shows us that? Graph A shows us. Graph A shows residuals are um, equally spread out or varied, whatever, equally spread on either side of LSRL, the least squares regression line. <sighs> That's it, but we need to conclude with linear regression. T model applies. Done. That is the last conditions that you are going to have to ever do. 
So I got this done for you today, and then tomorrow we will have all class period to be able to practice those because they are pretty intricate, and that will be pages 20 to 23.